This video is brought to you by Squarespace, the place to go for all of your website needs. Hop over to www.squarespace.com hue for a free trial. And if you like what you see and want to move forward, receive 10% off your first order by using the discount code hue at checkout. Thanks, Squarespace. Many of you have wondered when I might get around to doing a review of Nikon's $2,000 full-frame ZF camera. I suppose it took Nikon this long to get one to me because they know I am just about the slowest YouTuber in the segment. Okay. Or that I love my Leicas. Yes. Or who knows? Anyway, I've got one now. I slapped the Nikkor Z 40mm f2 on it. I whipped out our FM3A and the 40mm f2 Voigtlander manual focus only we bought for that. And within, I'm not exaggerating, 10 seconds of firing off a couple of shots at home, I already understood what I was seeing, aided in no small part by the facts that I've had every full-frame Z camera in hand, along with just about every other full-frame mirrorless camera in the market, that we've owned a Nikon Z7 II, and that we currently own or have in-house full-frame mirrorless ILCs from Leica, Sony, and Panasonic. Oh yeah, we own all of those, along with a pile of 35mm film cameras and one digital APS-H camera from Canon. Anyway, one. The ZF is a killer street kit without the constraints inevitably associated with the usual list of suspects for the title of best street kit. Two, its video performance is a quantum leap forward at this price point within the Nikon catalog, next level compared to the Z6 II or Z7 II, capable of holding its own against any other 24-ish megapixel full-frame camera out there. Three, its autofocus performance, stills and video, is also next level compared to the Z6 II and Z7 II, lifted close, if perhaps not completely whole cloth from the Z8 and 9, which makes it, in my book, as good or better than Canon, just about on par with the best from Sony. Four, the ZF, this is really interesting, has the best manual focus assists I have ever seen on any camera, mirrorless or not. It goes so far beyond simple focus peaking or magnification, which are not that great anyway, that it sets a new standard. And finally, five, I think Nikon has just put everyone on notice, and I mean everyone, that there is simply no higher functioning, fit for purpose, personality filled, anything close to 24 megapixel camera at anywhere near close to the price for street, as I've already mentioned, travel photography, or any other genre for that matter, with such a wide, deep, performant, and keenly priced lens catalog to go with it. In fact, you know what? I don't think there is another camera and lens ecosystem out there today, irrespective of sensor size. As I'm recording this just before Christmas 2023, 
quite as good for anywhere near the price for some of us at any price. Just wow. <laughs> Hey everybody, I'm Hugh Brownstone for Three Blind Men and an Elephant. I'm getting a little bit loopy, and I will be exceptionally brief for this first take on the ZF because A, I just told you what it is I think I'm seeing in the ZF. B, I received it too close to year end to do my usual real world shooting out on the streets of New York, which I most definitely will do in a future video. And C, Three months after its announcement, most of you watching this will, in all likelihood, have already seen a pile of other videos, many of them really excellent when it was launched, and you already know quite a bit about it. So, I will try to add value by putting it this way. First, this is a brilliant homage to second half 20th century film cameras that goes beyond looks and controls to size, weight, and feel in hand. Second, the autofocus is dead silent, quick and sure, more Z8, Z9 than Z6 II or Z7 II. That down to minus 10 EV for autofocus is no joke. I have never seen autofocus this good in light, that low, with the possible exception of the Z8 or Z9, or our Sony A7R5. Maybe. Third, the way the ZF handles manual focus lenses is revelatory. Focus confirmation for manual focus lenses is seamlessly integrated into the autofocus UI so that subject detection, even eye detection, even on our F-mount Voigtlander Ultron 40 F2 with dumb adapter, as opposed to, say, Voigtlander's Apo Lanthar 35 F2 in native Z-mount with usable electronic contacts, because the adapter that I have doesn't have that, is Fabulous. So, Leica, pay attention. Fourth, the performances of the 40F2Z and the camera's IBIS are so good, which is to say excellent for 99% of us, 99% of the time, that one can truly take advantage of that low light AF capability. So, kudos, Nikon. Rarely. Have I seen a camera which can deliver so completely on what I'll call a single pinnacle spec because most manufacturers do not fully take into consideration what else has to happen, what else has to be good for that spec to have any meaning in real life. Nikon clearly has. Fifth. The rest of the camera's operation is whip fast with not only real-time exposure preview, but depth of field preview Sixth, in spite of its relatively modest EVF specifications, like the Z6 and Z7 series before it, the ZF's EVF outperforms those specifications with a bright, sharp image. 
Seventh, the ZF has a great shutter release. Super quick, nice, sharp, clean break. Nice sound to go with it. And it is threaded for a larger shutter release button, but only the release button. You can't actually use it for a cable release. And eighth, I know I'm repeating myself here. It's not the first time I'm repeating myself in this video, but it does bear repeating. The ZF is one heck of an homage to the, in particular, FE, FM, F2, and FM3A 35mm film cameras, in particular, upon which it is so closely based. A real treat for anyone who wants his or her personal camera to be a fundamentally different experience, a liberation, really, from one's workaday mindset and muscle memory gear. Very much, I should say, how my Leica M11 and SL2 make me feel. Q3, much how my Hasselblad X2D makes me feel, which is very high praise indeed. The differences among these cameras and the ZF, however, beyond differences in resolution, heritage, industrial design, menu system, color science, and ultimate build quality, all accruing to the benefit of Leica and Hasselblad gear, and price accruing, obviously, to the benefit of the ZF, are that A. The ZF is dramatically better at shortening the distance between intent and execution by dint of superior functionality and lens catalog, at least in terms of breadth, depth, and value, and blows them away on a dollar-for-dollar -dollar size, weight, and performance basis. I just said that out loud. With all of this said, however, like everything else, it isn't perfect. In particular, many people, for example, will likely prefer the Ocaron Passim dial design of mirrorless ILCs to the retro dials of the ZF. Okay. Still, Fujifilm, especially, beware. On balance and taking into account Nikon's Z-mount lens ecosystem, I'll tell you that the ZF out Fujifilms the entire Fujifilm X system. I just said that out loud too. But do I like the little 1980s Casio calculator f-stop window in the top plate? No, not at all. It feels very much like an afterthought, although it is the only visual means of confirming the aperture outside of the EVF or rear panel for lenses like the 40 f2, which doesn't have an aperture ring. I'd much prefer confirmation of the aperture on the lens itself. Does this really matter in any case? No, it doesn't. Do I like the grip? No, but I understand the rationale for going this route. It is both an homage to the past and a recognition of the present, a compromise between actual mid-20th century ergos and modern sensibilities. I shoot with the Leica M11 and Q3 and they have no integrated grip very much in keeping with a retro vibe. So, well, in fact, the 1954M. So I use auxiliary grips and small rig for one makes a nice grip for the ZF for under 50 bucks. Do I wish the front and rear control dials were usable with gloves? Yes, it feels like the camera industry long ago forgot that most of the world experiences winter. Do I wish the 4K video had no crop. Yes. Do I really mind? No. Does the way Nikon implement manual ISO changes other than by the ISO dial straight from the factory make any sense whatsoever? No. Not for anyone who's coming to Nikon for the first time. Is this ameliorated? By the fact that you can customize the camera so that you only have to press one button, say, as I've done, remapped video record button to initiate ISO changes, which you can then make via the rear dial. Well, yes and no. It is a workaround, but it is an oddly bizarre workaround and makes no sense for this particular camera, given the positioning and ambition for it and what I believe is its target audience. My Leica M11 with a signable push-in rear dial is a lot better. 
Does the way Nikon implement auto ISO and the ability to switch between auto and manual ISO make sense? No, it doesn't. But do they explain it in the manual? Duh. However many hundred pages. Yes, they explain it. Does the fact that they explain it in the manual make up for it? No, it doesn't. For something as basic as the exposure triangle to be so counterintuitive, especially for someone coming from any other system, in particular smartphones. In other words, new customers from a generation that largely grew up without Nikon cameras altogether. This is a miss. But is it a deal breaker? No. Moving on. Do I wish the 40 millimeter F2 had an aperture ring? Yes. Does it matter all that much? No. Would I like the little LCD on the body, which shows aperture to be moved to the lens? Yes. I already told you that. Does this really matter? No. Is the 40 millimeter F2 as sharp as Nikon's incredible 51.8 S? I did a whole review on that. I'll put that link down below. No. Does it matter? No. This 40 F2 is light, compact, fast, silent to autofocus, and far superior optically to most 51.8s on the market. Brilliantly fit for purpose, I think, for its intended audience. I like it. Does it make sense to me? Let's move to something else. That the stills movie collar below the shutter speed dial is the same control for getting to what is, in essence, a black and white LUT. No. It should be an option independent of a stills or video switch because it is a fundamentally different thing. But does this matter to most people? No, I'm feeling more and more like the statistical outlier I usually am. But would it actually matter much to me? No. Would I actually prefer given that for my purposes, were I to own a ZF, it would be a stills centric camera, that the rear panel be a tilty screen rather than a flippy screen? Why, yes. Yes, I would. Although the video features are so thorough, so highly specced, that I understand the choice for video and true hybrid shooters, even if I think the screen real estate for a flip out rear panel is so small that I use external monitors for what we do anyway. Do I care that the ZF uses a micro HDMI port instead of a full sized port, as I always have demonstrated in the past? No, not really. Even though the ZF has so much video functionality, as I just said, I wouldn't use it for day in, day out video because I prefer the actively cooled Lumix S5 II that we use not only as our daily driver here in the Batcave, but as one of three we have for long form interviews. But if we didn't have the S5 IIs, well, then I would care. And it would be enough for me to skip past the ZF and go to the S5 II, which is fair to say, also a pretty great stills camera itself. The question is why? And the answer is because I use an HDMI cable every time I record here in the bat cave or on location. I always use a monitor. It's a 27 inch monitor right there. And then yes, really the micro HDMI would be a make or break issue. Literally experience has taught me that micro HDMI ports become unreliable almost instantly, almost always under anything but absolutely minimal use. Even so, there's no denying that the ZF is wonderfully specced. What is that? The third time I've said that and performant for video. In fact, you knew this was coming. You're seeing in action right now, along with the Z40 F2, as I'm using both to record this video, of course. Next, do I care? Hey, listen, I'm even getting tired of all these what's if, but I'm trying to give you a full view of what the camera is. Do I care that the ZF uses an SD card and a micro SD card? Not at all. If that's what Nikon needed to cram all of this goodness into a package this small and stylish. Do I care that the menu system is maybe even more complex than Sony's? To my astonishment, no, I don't really care. I, of course, wish the menu system were simpler, but the reality I think is this. There is better reason for the Nikon menu to be so complex. And that I think comes down to just how successfully tunable Nikon has made the autofocus system. 
I still haven't figured out how to use all of it, but on the basis of manual focus alone, I dig it. Finally, as someone who has consistently advocated for sensor resolution over longer lenses, do I wish the ZF had a higher megapixel count? Absolutely. Just not at the expense of anything else. Put differently, this camera at this price, with this functionality at this megapixel count, with access to both Nikon's superb Z lens catalog and to vintage lenses, more in keeping with the camera's aesthetic, along with the, hey guys, I just got to say, once again, brilliant focus assist for them, is as close to perfection for its intended purpose as any new camera I've seen over the last half decade. I'll wrap it up this way for now. I don't think I've ever reviewed a camera without bothering to share photographs I've taken with it. But in this case, having shot with every full frame Z camera and having significant experience with our own Nikon Z7 II and a number of modern Z lenses and manual focus or older autofocus Nikon lenses. And given that a week and a half later, I'm still recovering from jet lag after returning from Tokyo and just didn't have the time in the waning days of 2023 to give it a proper go on the streets of New York. As I said at the beginning, all it took was a couple of quick shots of Claudia, actually, which she made me promise I would not show because it was very early in the morning, to make it blindingly obvious what this camera is. The closest mirrorless ILC experience in the market today of shooting with a full-frame mechanical 35mm film camera. These days, closest to the 24-megapixel full-frame Leica M10, even a 61 megapixel M11 actually, except for this. The ZF is dramatically less expensive, less than one quarter the price of an M11, though yes, less than half the resolution. Yet the ZF makes it dramatically easier to capture a far higher proportion of keepers because Nikon has managed to uniquely combine retro styling and solid feel in hand with all of the mod cons from uber-performant autofocus and IBIS to essentially unlimited recording 4K and the best manual focus assists, say it with me now, I have ever seen. And beyond the 40mm F2Z, perfectly suited as the kit lens for it, uber-performant, accessibly priced lenses like their entire line of 1.S primes on the one hand, their less accessibly priced yet brilliant super telephotos for which Leica has no answer on the other, in a Small, unobtrusive package done in a way that Leica and Fujifilm, in fact, every other manufacturer for that matter, have not. Which is quite an extraordinary thing for me to say. The ZF is arguably the best homage to the past, for most of us anyway, without being burdened by the past. In fact, it's utterly state of the art in the business. To which I can only say, well done, Nikon. Bravo. You are going to have a pile of new ZF shooters. Yeah, that's it. This video is brought to you by Squarespace. From custom domains to beautiful websites using their easily customizable templates that you can have up and running in minutes, e-commerce, email and email marketing, SEO, analytics, and scheduling, Squarespace does it all and has done it for us for the last six years. If you are a small to mid-sized business in any industry, Squarespace is the place to go for all of your website needs. Hop over to www.squarespace.com hue for a free trial. And if you like what you see and want to move forward, receive 10% off your first order by using the discount code hue at checkout. Thanks, Squarespace. If you like what you've seen here today, please give a thumbs up, subscribe to the channel, join the conversation in the comments section below because this is an exceptional audience. If you'd like help with a portfolio review, gear selection, finding or honing your artistic voice, sign up for a one-on-one -on -one mentoring video call via Zoom at 3bmep.com booking. Finally, please consider supporting our work by using the no cost view affiliate links down below, sending us coffee money via PayPal, or most especially, joining us on Patreon, links down below as well. However you choose to support us, as always, we thank you for it.